Hey, what's going on, AP Government people? We have unit number four. This is the biggest, the most important, the most frequently tested unit on the exam, and we're going to cover as close to 10 minutes as we possibly can. All right, let's start talking about Congress. Special powers you must know that are given to Congress. They can declare war. The House does the impeaching, ratifying treaties and appointments. That's a Senate power. Plus, they are also the jury in an impeachment trial. Franking privilege allows them to use the post office to send stuff to their constituents, and they can also override presidential vetoes. Incumbency is a huge advantage in the House. Incumbency is the person who is the current seat holder. The delegate view is a view you should know for Congress, and this is when representatives vote according to how most of their constituents feel. So it's an accurate representation of most of their constituents. The trustee view is when representatives vote based on their own views. And there are different reasons why they may vote one way or the other, particularly if the issue is a controversial issue. Jumping over House of Representatives, revenue bills start in the House. Anything dealing with, the, with money must start in the House. Two committees that you should be familiar with, the Ways and Means, that deals with taxation and tariffs, etc. And the Rules Committee, this determines rules for bills. So, for example, will it be a closed bill with set time limits for debate and no amendments? Or will it be an open bill with looser time limits and amendments are allowed? This is something that you see a lot in the House of Representatives. Speaker of the House, they help choose the committee assignments and they are elected every two years by the party that is in control. Senate, VP serves as the president of the Senate. They could break a tie in case there's a 50-50 split. And the current president of the Senate is Vice President Mike Pence. Originally, they were elected by state legislatures. That was until the 19-teens with the 17th Amendment during the Progressive Era. The Finance Committee is similar to the Ways and Means Committee in the House. And a filibuster star this. Make sure you understand this. This is a special power given only to the Senate. This allows senators to talk a bill, to, a bill to death like Strom Thurmond did in the 1950s, in which if you are talking, then there will be no then there will be no voting on a bill. And this can be dragged out for hundreds and hundreds of days. The cloture motion, another important term to know, will end a filibuster when 60 members of the Senate agree to end a filibuster. So filibuster is only good until 60 members vote to end it. Congressional committees you should be familiar with. Members have a wish list of committees. They're appointed by high ranking members of both parties. Iowa representative, for example, would, would wanna be on the agricultural committee because there's a lot of corn grown in Iowa and the agricultural committee will have a lot of impact on Iowa. Most members serve on two committees and then two subcommittees, which are committees underneath main committees. Standing committees are permanent committees and subcommittees are when members report to larger committees on specific issues within that committee. Jump in and over the presidency, 22nd Amendment limits the president to two terms. I always think of this as two term 22, two term 22. And I have FDR up here because he's the only one elected more than twice. He was elected four times. 25th Amendment is a selection process for the vice president if there is a vacancy. The president gets to pick a vice president, but then they must be approved. Lame duck period. This is the period between an election of a new president and inauguration. So, for example, the most recent lame duck period was from November of 2016 to January 2017 when President Obama was still in office, but there was a new president, president-elect at the time, Trump. That's a lame duck period. Specific presidential powers you should know, they are commander-in-chief, they can veto bills, exe issue executive orders, and also chief diplomat. Powers not given to the president. Make sure you know that a line item veto is not given to the president. They cannot veto just certain parts of the bill. It has to be an all or nothing. They also cannot declare war, and they cannot create new cabinet positions. The presidential cabinet is a, a group of advisors to the president in which the head of each cabinet, known as a secretary, must be approved by the Senate. The executive office consists of several groups, the White House staff, National Security Council, and the Office of Management and Budget, or OMB. In the White House office, we have the chief of staff and the press secretary. They do not require Senate approval, unlike many other presidential appointments. And Reince Priebus is the current chief of staff. And Sean Spicer is the current press secretary, both for President Trump. 
NSC advises the president on military and foreign policy. And the Office of Management and Budget prepares the president's yearly budget. Remember, by law, the president is required to prepare a budget every year. And the OMB plays an instrumental role in that. The biggest predictor for funding for an agency is last year's budget. So if you were to guess how much money would a certain agency receive, well, look at last year's budget. And that's a pretty good indicator going forward. Some miscellaneous presidential terms you should know. War Powers Act, 1973, star this. This was passed over Nixon's veto, and it sought to limit the president's power to engage in military action. So Congress is trying to gain some control back that they gave away to the president. Enumerated powers are powers that are specifically given to the president. Inherent powers are those that are not specifically mentioned in the Constitution such as issuing executive orders and declaring states of emergency. Those are not specifically mentioned in the Constitution, but the president can use them. The bureaucracy, this is the non-elected government officials that work for government agencies. You have the Office of Personal Personnel Management, which hires most federal workers. Civil Service Exam, instituted in the 1880s after President Garfield was assassinated. This is when employees are hired based on merit, on what they know, not patronage, or who they know. And there, the bureaucracy is part of the Iron Triangle. Remember the three parts, bureaucracy, interest groups, and Congress. Independent regulatory agencies regulate aspects of the economy, such as the Federal Reserve and the Securities and Exchange Commission, or the SEC. And Janet Yellen is the current head of the Fed or the Federal Reserve Board. Jumping on over to, to the judicial branch. Marbury vs. Madison, you know it, 1803, this established judicial review. Amicus Curie Circle, this you need to know that means friends of the court, in which interest groups can petition the Supreme Court about a case. They can write a letter and say, hey, if you vote, if you rule this way, this is how it will impact us. And many cases that go to the Supreme Court have Amicus Curie briefs. Judges serve for life. They are appointed by the president, but must be approved by the Senate. And district courts are courts of original jurisdiction. That's where a case begins. And the Court of Appeals is the next one above the district courts. And they can review cases from district courts. And guess what? The Supreme Court can review cases from both of those bad boys. So the three layers of the judicial branch know those three court systems. Supreme Court, this is the last hope for appeal if you are appealing a court case. There's this important thing called the rule of four. If four judges agree, then they'll hear your case. So all you need is four out of nine judges to say, you know what? We should take a look at this case and the Supreme Court will. And presidents pick justices that share similar views to that president. That's part of their legacy. Some key terms you need to know with the judicial branch. Stare de cc's. I always butcher that. This means let the decision stand. And this is using precedent to determine an outcome. Writs of certiorari. Yep. Supreme Court reviews a case from a lower court. So that's the Supreme Court saying to a lower court, you know what? We want to take a look at that case ourselves. Send that bad boy up to us. An original intent. This is looking at the Constitution based on the intent of the framer. So how would people like Alexander Hamilton view a case that's the original intent doctrine that you'll often hear about divided government this is when congress or one house at least and the executive branches are controlled by different parties so for example a republican is in the white house but democrats control congress that's divided government this leads to difficulties in passing laws and confirming appointees because one party is not in control of both branches all right, let's do a quick recap. Powers of Cong Congress and each house, no specific ones for each house. Making a bill, no about committees. Close versus open rule, what does that mean? And a filibuster, that's only for the Senate, remember. Powers given to the president, powers not given to the president, be able to identify them. Bureaucracy in the Iron Triangle. Why do judges serve for life? We didn't mention it, but it's so that they are not influenced by public opinion that they can make decisions they think is right regardless of how the public feels key terms such as the rule of four the writs of certiorari and stare de cc's man i butcher that every time i say it and divided government how this can lead to issues all right guys look forward to see you back here for period number five in 10 minutes thanks for watching best of luck this year especially in may you'll do great and have a good day